My life has always been on the road. Ever since I was one week old, I've traveled the United States and the world. You could say I'm a modern day nomad. What I love about travel is meeting new people, discovering new things, and getting to know more about the vast body of Christ that flows around the world. This trek will take us to the land of the Bible. I'm Stevie, and you're watching Stevie's Treks to the Holy Land. Welcome to the Holy Land, the land of promise. On this trek, we're going to be exploring the land where it all took place. We're going to be digging deep into our Bibles to discover amazing stories that came to pass right where I stand. Have you ever wondered how big the Sea of Galilee actually is? Or how hard it would be to climb Mount Sinai? Have you ever thought, what would it be like to live in a tent for your whole life, just like Abraham? Well, I'm here to find out. The Bible has so many stories. We could read it our whole life and still find amazing new things every day. But for this trek, we're going to follow only one story that flows throughout all of Scripture. It's a story that has many different heroes and villains, even more twists and turns. But for this story, God uses one family to keep a promise designed for the whole world. This family started with one man, Abraham. We find the beginning of Abraham's life recorded in the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings. In fact, in Hebrew, the book's name actually means, in the beginning. To learn a little bit more about Abraham, we're in modern day Israel, in the city of Jerusalem. We're here to talk to Dr. Paul Wright. Dr. Wright is an expert in the land of the Bible, and he'll be able to help us start our journey into the life of Abraham. Dr. Wright, Steve, it is so good to see you. Oh, thanks so much for having us. Okay, Dr. Wright, so we're trekking through the land of Israel, wow. and we're trying to discover a little bit more about the life of Abraham. The Bible starts off, Genesis 11, with him living in a place called Ur. Uh, today it's southern Iraq. Flatland, uh, dry, because there's not much rainfall, really hot in the summertime. But the nice thing about the place is a lot of water river water, and good stuff to drink and good stuff to grow crops from. Living water. Living water, sure. exactly. Okay. Yeah. And back in those days, you counted wealth by food. Nobody had gold and money. There was no money. Nothing right. Like that. But food, and if you had enough food to live on and to sell and to trade for other things you needed, you were wealthy. And this place was uh, great for food. Pretty big for those days. Hmm. And in places, the wall of the city itself was 100 feet thick. Inside the city, big buildings. Hmm. You know, the palaces and the temples and this sort of thing. Well, this is where the Abraham story begins. Right. Out of Ur, out of Babylon. And uh, at one point, in the Bible it's just one verse mm -hmm. apart, but at one point he gets to a place called Haran. The word itself means crossroads. So that says something about how busy the place might have been. Right, people were coming and going. Coming and going all the time, yeah. trade going through. I mean, you could sit there and make a buck. Now, at some point, Abraham journeyed with his father all the way to Haran, which is in modern day Turkey. Haran was a true urban center. Haran had money. It was the perfect place to settle down and live the good life. But God had a different plan, a bigger plan for Abraham's life. While Abraham was living in Haran, God came to Abraham and said, Abraham, you must leave your country, your people, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. And all people on earth will be blessed through you. Abraham was no longer at home in the land of his birth. 
He had been told by the living God to leave everything he knew and journey to a new land, to a land that was not rich in natural resources or as prosperous as the cities he had grown up in. It was a land that the Lord would show him. What would it have been like to live like Abraham lived? Dr. Wright told us that the closest thing we could find to Abraham's lifestyle is the modern Bedouin. The Bedouin are nomadic. That means they move from place to place depending on the needs of their animals. Okay, so we've arrived at our camp in the Wadi Rum so that we can discover more about how Abraham would have lived. We brought our truck through this gorge, as you guys can see that strip of blue. We came down the middle of that and ended up at our campsite, wedged right down in between this crevice in this massive face of a wall. You know, kids, the world in which the Bible was written doesn't exist anymore. That world was a long time ago. Think about it. Abraham lived 4,000 years ago. Our world is so different from his. But there are windows today that we can look through that lead us back to Abraham's world. For example, out of any place in the world you can go today, coming to the Wadi Rum and hanging out with the Bedouin is as close as you're gonna get to experiencing what Abraham's life would have actually been like. Abraham would have lived in a tent similar to this one at this Bedouin camp. This is the inside of a Bedouin tent. Now you'll notice it's one big communal living space. So if you're living in a Bedouin tent, you're definitely not getting your own room. Mom and dad would maybe sleep here and the kids would sleep over here. What if you had guests? Well, they'd sleep down there. What it's made out of though is pretty interesting. This stuff is all goat hair. It's real, real coarse, tightly woven goat's hair. Now here's the thing folks, when you're in the desert, you don't want to be directly exposed to the sun. This sun is brutal. So even though it can get pretty toasty in here during the day, it's still better than being outside. I was on the lookout for what Dr. Wright described as the Bedouin art of hospitality. From Abraham all the way to modern day, Bedouin have been known for their hospitality. They would invite strangers and visitors into their tent and allow them to become an extension of their home. While we were in the Wadi Rum, we experienced just that. Okay, so we're gonna go for a ride out in this land cruiser with our guide, Hassan. Guys, this is gonna be awesome. Because we're driving in the sand, it's best to release the the air. Don't try this at home, and if you do, wear your seatbelt. Man, that ride was great. Yeah. Ah, shukran. Have fun. Thank you. Have fun. Thank you. That was awesome. That was awesome.
Okay guys, we got a real treat today. We're being shown how to bake bread in sand. Believe it or not, isn't that crazy? Let's check it out. Okay, so what they end up doing is they build a fire super hot on the sand. They get the sand real toasty. And then they make the dough. Then they push the fire back and they'll slap the dough on the sand. Cover the dough with sand and then end it and then what they'll end up doing is putting the embers on top of the sand so the heat seeps down from the sand to the dough. They don't want to put the, the wood or the embers on top of the dough because it'll end up burning it. The craziest part about this whole thing is how does the sand not stick to the dough? I have no idea. It's Bedouin technology. They've got a trick up their sleeve with that or something. You can smell it. I actually don't even know how to identify the smell because you'd think it would smell similar to campfire. I'm not getting that yet. I think the campfire smell has come and gone. And what I'm smelling now is, I honestly can't even tell you, but it's a distinct smell. I'll work on it and get back to you later. If you're ever not sure what to do when you're angry, just beat your bread. Just giving it a good clean before we get to the final product. Giving it a good smack down, good beat down. It's good. Yes. Here's a moment of truth, folks. No sand. No sand. You know, actually, I think he's right, guys. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, guys. It's actually, I'm, I'm dead serious. It's pretty good. It's got a really crunchy, crispy outside. The inside's a semi-doughy. Nice contrast from the outside. The fact is, there's no sand. There's no grit in my teeth. Okay, so if you notice down here, he breaks it up into pieces. So it's not just as a whole, and then you can break some off. And my prediction that it sits like a brick on your stomach was correct. Very hearty, and it's also been said that this is a, one of the best meals for the Bedouin. It also goes excellent with tea. So we do a bit of, we do it like this, folks. Oh. Oh, I like those flavors. Why don't I? complement it with some tea flavors. Oh, and if you don't mind, we'll let the family pet. That kitten likes it. We'll let the family pet have some. See, here in the Bedouin lifestyle, we're all family. All right, so we're coming to the close of our day here in the Bedouin camp. And as you can see, I'm gonna be sleeping in the Bedouin tent, trying it out. But I want you guys to imagine with me for a second. On a night just like tonight, God came to Abraham. Now that Abraham was in a position to rely on God, God decided to make a unique promise with Abraham. The first part of the promise was that Abraham would have a son. The second part was that from Abraham's son would come a great nation of many people. Okay, just, just think with me for a second. Abraham's out here in the desert and he looks up at the sky and sees all these stars. And God comes to him and says, Abraham, your family is going to be greater, bigger than all those stars you see. That's a big family. 
So that's just something for us to, to think about and dream about tonight. It seemed like God's plan had been set in motion, but there was a problem. The entire promise rested on the first part, that Abraham and his wife, Sarah, would have a son. But Abraham and Sarah were too old to have children. When God made his promise, Abraham was 75 and Sarah was over 65. Even though it seemed unlikely, Abraham had faith that God would give him a son. And then they waited. They waited five, 10, 15, 20 years and no son. To Abraham and Sarah, it could have seemed like the promises of God were not real. Finally, after 20 years, when Abraham was 100 years old, God gave them a son. Holding his new son in his arms, Abraham could rejoice that God's hand had intervened and given him Isaac. This challenge to his faith ended with a miraculous birth. But it was not the last time his faith would be tested. So here at Tel Beersheba, we got to take some safety precautions. The main one we got to take is wearing a hard hat. The Bible tells us Abraham eventually brought his family here to this area. We learned from Dr. Wright and then from the Bedouin that water is essential for survival. We think Abraham came here because of the abundance of water and it's here that Isaac grew up. <laughs> you want to get a hat that fits you. Okay, so we're at Tel Beersheba today. Not Beersheba, but Beersheba. The word bear means well. The word Sheva means seven in Hebrew. Now we know from the biblical story that Abraham would have set up his main camp around here. We also know that Abraham and his son Isaac would have dug some wells around the area. So here's a well right here. I'm gonna see how, how deep it goes. Let's check it out. One, two. That is one deep well. Let's go look at more of the tell. Walking around Beersheba, I can just imagine Abraham and Isaac. I can imagine Abraham helping Isaac with his first steps, giving him a whole bunch of toys and teaching him everything he knew about life and about God. I'm sure that Isaac had become the joy of Abraham's life. But it was here that Abraham and Isaac's story takes an interesting turn. Everything seemed to be going well, but out of nowhere, Abraham's life was rocked to its core. God told Abraham that Isaac had to be killed and that Abraham would be the one to kill him. What would have been going through Abraham's mind? he must have questioned why God would do this. And he must have wondered how God would keep the rest of his promise if Isaac were to be killed. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
once again, God's promise looked like it would go unfulfilled. It looked like his promises were not real. Okay, so I've been invited over some of my friend's house for their traditional Shabbat dinner. Their names are Gary and Cindy Butler. I also know that my friend Gary knows quite a bit about Abraham, so I'm gonna try and see if I can pull some more information out of him to gain a better perspective on what Abraham's life would have been like. So come on, let's go talk to him. Okay. It'll come off not quickly. Not. Hey, come in. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. It, good. You guys busy? In the midst of preparation. Preparation? I have my Shabbat shirt on, so I had to wear an apron. I like it. Otherwise, I, I would decorate it with tomato juice. Cindy, how you doing? Good, good to see you. You too. Thanks Welcome. for having us so Thanks much. I'll trade Welcome this. Welcome to the Old City and the best restaurant in Jerusalem. Oh, well, oh yeah. I'll believe that. <laughs> okay. Okay, we'll see you in a bit, Cindy. All right. See okay. You. Thanks, honey. Okay, well. What do we need here? Uh, I think we ought to go to a, sort of a special little, I'm gonna, you know Wherever what? you want, man. I'm gonna grab my Bible, my Bible here. Okay. Let's come over here where we can see something's kind of special. Um, Gary, this is gorgeous. Yeah, we kind of, kind of pinch ourselves that we live right here in the middle of this. And you're in the middle of the Muslim quarter, actually, up in this way is the Christian quarter, the Jewish quarter, and this is the Muslim quarter, and way over there is the, is the Armenian quarter. But uh, we have the Via Dolorosa Street, which is a traditional way of the cross. You hear cars down here. Yeah. It's, it's a place where just a lot of people are compacted in here, but that spot for centuries and centuries and centuries has been very special. Way back, the time of Abraham, this was all barren. These homes, these families, none of this was here. And there was a small escarpment of rock that came up that is now under that gold dome. And that's the place where he said, I want you to sacrifice your son. So he would have left the servants down, probably down. As Gary and I talked, he told me the rest of the story. Abraham and Isaac made their way to this area. And here, the greatest test of Abraham's life took place. As they approached the place, Isaac asked his father, Where is the lamb? And Abraham said, The Lord will provide the lamb. We know from the Bible that Abraham believed that God was able to raise up Isaac from the dead. I can only imagine how Abraham must have felt, how fear of the unknown must have gripped his heart. And then there was a moment when Abraham looked at his son and started to tie his hands. Gary described something amazing. Isaac didn't struggle, he didn't fight, he didn't run away, but he stayed and allowed his father to place him on the altar. I can only imagine how Isaac must have felt and how deeply he trusted his father. Then an angel of the Lord said, Abraham, do not harm your son. So Isaac didn't die. No, he didn't. No. An angel of the Lord stopped his hand and he looked over and there was a ram that was caught in the bushes. And that was the sacrifice. That was the substitute that went on there. So there was a sacrifice. Right. But the ram replaced the Isaac. Son. Yeah, it's amazing to think that in this tiny little spot, God chose to unfold his history, tell his story, reveal himself. Right there. Right there. Abraham had learned to trust in God. 
The binding of Isaac proved once and for all that Abraham would depend on God, even if it didn't make sense at the time. Abraham's name for this mountain in Hebrew means, the Lord will provide. God did provide for Abraham and would continue to provide for him and his children in the years that followed. As we sat down to our Shabbat dinner and reflected on the story of Abraham, I remembered all that I had learned. The experiences of Abraham's life, the journey from the comforts of home to a difficult land, waiting expectantly for a son, and now the last minute rescue of his son from death all made him more than just the father of any nation, but of a nation that belonged to God. God fulfilled the first part of his promise to Abraham. Abraham died believing in faith that the rest of the promises would be fulfilled. I can't wait to find out the rest of the story. How will God make Isaac's children into a great nation? And how will that nation bless the world? Until next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and give you peace.